our praise. Can somebody give that guy a hand clap of the yeah. Oh God, we worship you in this place.
11 through 13 says, Teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart, that I may fear your name. I will praise you, Lord, my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever. For great is your love toward me. You have delivered me from the depths of the realm of the dead.
I have zero intention of stopping this prayer. None. None whatsoever. There are needs that we have here. They, they must be met. There are people who need to talk to Jesus this morning. There are people who need a breakthrough. There are people who just need to know that he loves them. So I have no intention this morning of stopping that. But I would like to remind you of exactly how much he loves you. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says this. For we are his workmanship. For we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. Which God prepared beforehand. So that we would walk in them. Do you know that you are the very artwork of God? When he looks at you, he sees something special. He sees something worth working for and toward. <laughs> Have you ever talked to an artist that didn't like what he did? No, an artist takes great pleasure in the things that he's made. And independent of where you are in your life, I want you to know that God takes great pleasure in who you are. And he takes even greater pleasure in making you who you are going to be. You are his artwork, and he will not forsake you. He will not forget you. You are special to him. Sing one more song for me, brother. Just one more. Can we praise God, and can we remember? Can we remember how much he loves us?
Welcome to Sunrise, where we believe that you are never alone, that you never face a trial on your own, that you will never be abandoned by the Lord that we serve, and that you will never be forgotten. Welcome to Sunrise, just about the greatest place on the face of the planet, as far as I can tell. Thank you so much for being here. If you're new and the seat back in front of you, you're going to find a visitor's card. We would love it if you would fill this out for us. It doesn't have intruding information. We won't post it online. We won't make fun of you. It just asks us for it just asks you to provide us a little information about yourself, about your family, and about your prayer needs so that we can pray with you. And if you fill that out, you can drop it in the little box um, in the doors on the way out. Uh, you can hand it to oh hand it to anybody. We're very friendly people. It, it'll it'll get to pastor. As you can tell, we're kind of a family here. So, um, it's wonderful to be here. In my heart, I can't stress enough the idea that you are not alone. And I think there's, just let me rest on that just for just a second. I have been through so many things in my relatively young life. And at the end of every one of those trials, I've looked back and I've seen God. I've seen what he was doing and where he was taking me. And I didn't always see that in the midst of the trial. That's something that I needed a little distance from the pain in order to really see. So if you're in the midst of one of those trials, and I know there are a few of us. If you're in the midst of one of those trials, let me reassure you, based on the experience and the scriptural testimony that you are not, not, not alone. And that God has something great for you, a work planned for you. You are his artwork. Let him finish the job. Lord, thank you, Father, for being here. We welcome you into this service. We welcome you into our lives, Father, and our hearts, Lord Jesus, and we joyfully sing your praises. We ask you to bless the rest of this service, Lord God. We ask you to bless Pastor as he ministers the word. We ask you to bless Pastor Brian as he comes to take an offering. We ask you to bless each and every one that's been here with us, Father, and we thank you so much for being here, too. In your name, amen. Pastor Brian. morning. I was going to go a different direction, but for some reason I just can't shake this story that I read recently. So I'm not going to try to make it connect. I'm just going to share what it is. So I was reading about a church in Korea. It's a very famous church. One of the, in fact, I believe they're the largest congregation in the world. I think by now they've been, they have over a million people who are part of their church. So big congregation. Yeah. Yeah. They're, kind of, they're small groups, probably like a couple of their small groups are like our church, I guess. I don't know. But it's, it's an incredible church, but it, this story actually happened in the 70s when money was actually worth something. And, and they were talking about, they were trying to build a new sanctuary, and I don't know what that looks like. I don't know if that's like a city. I don't know if you build for that big of a congregation, but they, they really don't. They just have a lot of services. They don't make them that big as the sanctuary. And they said they raised about enough money to lay the concrete foundation and put the pillars in, but that was it. And they were in a prayer meeting, not a church service, not taking up an offering, just a prayer meeting. And they were just some lady, some elderly lady came up to the pastor after the prayer meeting and she said, I just feel like I'm supposed to give everything I have to this church building. And she brought up a rice bowl, chopsticks, and I don't remember what the third item was, but something along those lines. And they were all made out of silver. And the pastor's like, look, you know, just take that, like that's. Like, just keep what little you have. And she's like, it, no, no, no. I want to just express my love to God. And it's okay. I can eat my rice on a piece of cardboard with my hands. It's not a problem. And uh, this was, man was moved. And he got up and he's like, you know what? I'll pay $1,000 for those items and give the money to the church. And it said that then all of a sudden a wave of sacrifice went across that congregation and People started saying, some women said, you know what, we'll just sell our hair to, for wig companies. And they raised just an incredible amount of money because of all, all of a sudden the sacrifices that people felt like they needed to make. 
And again, not a church service, a prayer meeting. And I think sometimes, you know, obviously, I'm talking about giving, and I'm not asking somebody to say, I'm not saying I feel like somebody's going to give everything you have and donate your Corvette to me. But, but, I see somebody's avoiding eye contact over there. <laughs> but in all seriousness, it's not about the sacrifice. It's about actually what was behind it. And this church is known for people showing up and praying. Showing up on a Friday night and 15,000 people going to the sanctuary, locking the doors and praying the entire night. People going to what they call Prayer Mountain for a weekend where they're just praying all weekend. And really the thing that I feel like the Lord just obviously, I feel like his fingers on, his hands on, is just that while we're taking up an offering, and it's about the love of God. That's what made the, you know, this elderly woman say, I want to give everything I have. She didn't say because she cares so much about the sanctuary being built, but she wanted to express her love to God and recognize the critical need to help reach the lost world. And so when we're giving, what we're not doing is trying to earn something from God, not to prove our love to God. We're just simply saying, God, I love you. And we recognize there is a massive need. You can turn the news on for about 30 seconds and you realize there is a massive need in this world. And as much as I encourage voting and everything else, it's not American politics that are going to solve it. It's not the Israeli government that's going to fix the problem in the Middle East. It's not Iran getting a new government system. It's only going to change through the power of the one who sits on the throne in heaven, and that's God Almighty himself. And that's, we're not giving to make him do something, but I'm actually just moving away from giving, and I'm saying we're seeking his face. And when he says to do something like give, it's because he's making a difference in the world, not because he's like, I just want you to suffer a little bit more. It's a, re it's a reality of out of our love and obedience to God. We're seeking his face, and we're moving in obedience to him so that we can see the world changed by the gospel, really one soul at a time. And so if you feel like God's putting you in your heart to give this morning, obviously, again, I'm not saying I feel like anybody's got to give everything you own. You're going to have to follow the leading of the Lord, but just encourage you to do that. Follow the leading of the Lord. And it might feel like it's not a lot, but just like this young, this, I keep saying young because I work with youth students and young adults, but this elderly woman who gave a rice bowl and some chopsticks led to a construction of a massive church to help continue to reach, like I said, now I think they have over a million people in their congregation, so they're doing some mighty works. So there's a few ways you can give. There's offering envelopes on the chairs in front of you if you want to give by cash or check. If you want to give digitally, you can text the word, all one word, Sunrise Giving 1130 to 888-364-GIVE, or you can go on the website, yeah, hit donate, and it'll, all, all those things will take you to the same spot, and you can give that way, if I may pray for us. Lord, I ask that we would be like this lady over there in the 70s in Korea who said, I'm willing to give everything because we love you. Lord, whether it's our checking account, whether it's our lives, our time, a career change, volunteering in a ministry, going across the street to help somebody who doesn't look like us, Helping a neighbor who annoys us. Lord, I ask that we would be people who would emulate you, Jesus. And that not only would we pray because we have certain things we want you to do, but Lord, we would be just as quick, in fact, more quick, to listen to what you're saying. And that we would respond and no longer just complaining about the world, but be a part of you making a change and a difference in this world. Lord, that we would be empowered by your spirit. And Lord, that just as we just heard the story of what you did decades ago in a place in Korea, that there would be such a wave of sacrifice, not just financial sacrifice, but sacrifice of life that we realize that the here and now is nothing compared to the eternity we have with you. And that we would have a heart that's broken for the lost, dying world and want to see them come to the same saving knowledge that we've had the experience to have. And so, Lord, let our hearts align with that type of just sheer desire to love you so much that we would say yes to anything you ask of us. Bless the offering. Bless those who are doing that very thing. And for those who want that, but they just feel like there's a step of challenge in the way, Lord, I ask that today would be a day that at least a baby step would happen. And they're able to make another step forward in their walk of faith and just be able to see 
your amazing provision, your incredible power, and just your ability to take any sacrifice and make something big out of it. So we praise you. We thank you this morning for all that you're doing. In your mighty name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. If you're in Epic, we have Epic this morning. For the rest of you, check out the announcement video. morning. I'd like to take the opportunity to invite everybody to an evening of praise and prayer on May 5th, starting at 6 p.m. Um, we're going to have some live praise and worship. After that, we're going to just do uh, have some time for uh, prayer ministry to do their thing as well. So um, if you, that sounds like a good idea to you guys, uh, I'd just like to take the opportunity to invite you all out. Thank you. Hope to see you there. construction barrel and what soil does that grow in? Potholes. It grows, it grows here. You're very close. So, so you thought it was apple blossoms and dirt and that's pretty good but, but now we're going to go with orange construction barrels and potholes. I, I kind of uh, noticed, how many of you have made a life study of Michigan potholes? You've, you've been around before, you've seen the different kinds. Okay, it's structures. Now I think potholes are interesting. How many of you know that, that if you're going slow they're not a problem? Well, most of them aren't a problem. It depends how deep they are. If you go in and your wheel disappears, that's bad. Okay, but mostly they're not. How many of you know you just get a little bit of a boop, you come up? How many of you know if you're going fast enough, they're not a problem. You kind of skip over them. There's just a da -da 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 -da. But every once in a while, you get the worst of all possible worlds. How many of you have ever just hit one at the wrong speed and the jolt? that it puts in your car. You're pretty sure your tire just got slashed all the way through and you're gonna sink down because that thing was a razor sharp edge. Now, now I mention this because I know it's a really weird way to start a message to talk about potholes, but potholes are really very simple, aren't they? What happens, I, uh, so your structural engineers here, how do potholes happen, why? Okay, so it actually cracks the pavement, and it, it can, if there's enough water, kind of wash the support out from underneath. We were talking about that in our parking lot not too long ago, weren't we, Greg? And so then there's nothing underneath it, and it collapses. And you have a chunk that's all there, and then this part that isn't, Brandon. There, and there is, that is the story of Michigan roads, poor quality materials and construction. Absolutely. So it's a simple enough process. And eventually the rubble gets knocked out of the hole one way or another, and it just becomes a canyon. And that thing can change your life, or at least it can change your car's life, which might have an impact on you. Simple thing, easy to miss, sometimes easy not to notice, until there are too many of them. How many of you have ever been in a target-rich environment? Lots and lots of potholes. Okay, uh, we remember one time we were out west and, and we were driving into Glacier National Park on the east side and there's a road that starts kind of in one jurisdiction and it goes to another jurisdiction. And the problem is, is the road that is farther in, which ends in this beautiful alpine lake that you swear you're in Switzerland. That road is beautiful. The road to get to that road, the only road to get to that road is the pothole collection of the universe. Literally, when you're driving 55 miles an hour down the middle of the road, it shows you A, there's very little traffic, and B, it's the only safe place left on the road. There's a lot of it. Now, why would I bring this up? 
because as we've been working through this process in 2 Peter 1, and again, a few weeks ago, I thought, I think we're wrapped up with this. I think we're done. And then I asked Pastor Brian, do you, you want to do one of these? And he said, yes, and he did such a capable job. How many of you loved that image he put on the screen of that path stapled to the cliff? How many of you said, I would never go there? How many right now, you say, I would never walk on that insane path stapled to the cliff? How many of you, something rolls up in you and said, I'm all over that. Show me, I'm going. Okay, absolutely. It's like, I want to walk on that. Anybody who went to the energy and time was stapling that thing on that cliff. Did you notice that the path leaned into the rock? They're not stupid. They didn't lean away from the rock. You have to hold on for dear life. He actually let it leaned into safety. Somebody thought that process through. Pretty cool. He did such a good job talking about godliness which is a narrow path between legalism and, hey, do anything you want. And I said, wow, there's a simple concept. It's so easy to read past the word godliness, and you think you know exactly what it means. How many of you there? Well, you act like God. That, that's all it means. Did you really realize how narrow that path can be? Until Pastor Brian unpacked it. So I started thinking, maybe I need to do just a little bit more. But look, because I was going to this week deal with love. I was going to cap it. I joked that that's what Pastor Brian was going to do. That's the top rank, if you will, of the wall that we started building with faith. We said, that'd be great. But then I thought, next week is Mother's Day. And Pastor Brian and I were talking. He goes, that would be a cool way to cap it is to talk about love. Any of you moms love your kids? Or at least like them? Okay. How many of us love our kids but don't always like them every day? I, I, I love the honesty, right? I mean, you do. You, you, you hate it when they move away. How many of you have had that situation where your last kid has moved away? You've been there, right? It wasn't, well, yeah, it's kind of a mix of, yeah, and, oh. I mean, I don't know. Some of us just love it when that last kid leaves. When my last kid moved away on Father's Day of all possible days, tells me, I'm moving to Cleveland. <laughs> It was just like a gut punch. It was so hard to see them go away. This is a terrible thing. So, so we can go through these processes, can't we, where we're, we're, we're struggling. We're struggling with the changes that go on in our life. And I started thinking one of these simple things that if we're going to end with love, if we're going to talk about how a mother's love has a powerful and profound effect, maybe we need to hit one more thing in between on that list. And so today is a, if you will, the two-word sermon. You say, Pastor, you've already said way more than two words. I know. And we have communion. I know. We're going to get there. Don't worry about it. I want to go to the middle of the text where it talks about adding brotherly kindness. What is brotherly kindness? Maybe it isn't what you think it is. That's in First Peter, sorry, 2 Peter 1. I'm going to bounce you here to Hebrews 13. Open to Hebrews 13. Verse 1. So Bob was over there racing through to get it. You can hear the clicks. Hebrews 13, 1. He's almost there. How many of you have ever volunteered in the sound and video room? How many of you know that if you do everything right, nobody notices? If you're late... Five seconds, everybody notices, and that's just unfair. Okay, anyway, Hebrews 13, 1, I'll read it for you. Let brotherly love continue. Then it unpacks. Even though this isn't our main text necessarily, it says, do not forget to entertain strangers. Now, wait a second. Strangers, brothers, we'll get to that in just a moment, but don't forget to entertain strangers. How many of you regularly have strangers show up at your house? Okay, they might come to sell you something. They might come to deliver something. I was chasing the guy. I went to see uh, Pastor Dan and Sister Sarita last week, and I was actually chasing this Amazon driver down the road. How many of you have been to Pastor Dan's house? You know where it is. I hate Lovejoy Road. I mean, it's a beautiful road, and getting out there, I love to drive in the country. How many of you know none of the addresses on the south side of the road have anything to do with any of the addresses on the north side of the road because it's the county line? And so you actually, if you, if you put in Google search, it will take you to the wrong place. So I'm chasing this Amazon truck up and down the road looking for Pastor Dan and Serena's house. It's funny, I can run into them here and there. So there are strangers just like them. Do not, how many of you think, I'm going to invite the Amazon guy in for a cup of coffee and some, you know, coffee? No, you don't? Okay, do not forget to entertain strangers. 
for by so doing some have unwittingly entertained angels. Perfect. Thank you, John, for pointing that out. Thank you for getting it. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. Again, how many of us think, ah, oh, it's a great day. The sun's out. The long looks here. Let's go to the jail and visit some prisoners today. Now, I know some of you have done prisoner ministry. Wally has. Thank you. And that's a wonderful blessing. I'm not making fun of it. I'm just saying that doesn't usually come to mind, right? You get up and there's this that you're going to do and that you're going to do, and you're not usually thinking, I'm going to go see prisoners. But the thing that motivates that entertaining of strange, wandering Amazon drivers and seeing prisoners is this idea of brotherly love, which, if you remember from American history and trivia, is the nature of the name of the city of Philadelphia, perfectly the city of brotherly love. So I want to I want to say brotherly kindness because that's what is referred to in Second Peter one. What does that mean? All right, what does it mean to be nice? I mentioned this a few weeks ago, but I just kind of hit it and went on. What does it mean to be nice? How many of you say you're a nice person? How many of you would def okay? Now that that's a little scary. We had about seven. You know, we get up here and say, this is a great family church. However, most of us are not nice. <laughs> okay. 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 So, so, so what, you said it, not me. So, so, I mean, what does it mean to be nice? Friendly? Yeah, John. Overlook somebody else's faults. Okay. They're really being irritating, but you're, you're not going to respond to it. Somebody agree. Treat people well. Okay, good. We have three answers on this side. This side is taking the fifth. Respectful and courteous. Respectful and courteous. How many of you that sounds pretty good? I mean, you might aspire to being a little bit nice. I'm going to throw you a curve. How many of you know that in some degree, nice is kind of a negative thing? What do you mean? Well, some of you said overlooking offenses and problems. Have you ever seen somebody behave really badly and you don't say anything because you want to be seen as nice? Does that help them? <laughs> somebody said yes. <laughs> it helps them move on. Get away from me. Okay, and now, now think about this for a second. Why how many of you do that for your own kids? Your kids. Now, now, there's a difference. I better define. We live in a weird culture where if my kids do something wrong and somebody else says something about it, I defend my kids. Maybe they don't deserve it, but I do it. But on the other hand, how many of you don't say anything to your own kids when they're being difficult. You don't? Because there's problems then. So maybe I should ratchet the calendar back because you and I have the same issue, Sandy. We have adult children. Anybody here, you're an adult child of somebody? Well, that should be all of you because I don't think any of you like showed up on a hill. Okay, how many of you occasionally have differences? If you still have the blessing of having your parents with you, how many of you have differences of opinion at times with those parents? And then those parents speak into your life, and they say something negative. Man, the walls go up, and you're like, hey, hey, wait a second. I, like you, am an adult. I don't answer to you anymore. That's how it works. Okay, I, I understand that can be the case. So ratchet the calendar back. Now we're talking to children who are minors and live in your home. For some of you, you have them. For some of you, you remember them. When they were minors, did you occasionally call them to account for behavior that was not the best. Yes. Now, I know why we should do that. You all did it out of sheer nobility. You wanted to make sure that your kids grew up to these wonderful, appropriate, mature individuals. And it had nothing to do with the fact that they were annoying the daylights out of you. Maybe a little of that, too. Just a little. And so you corrected them. What would have happened if you would have never corrected them? 
He would have gone to Columbia University. Sorry, that, that had to come out. <laughs> I mean, if you think about that for a second, they would have chosen to behave in a very entitled and negative sense. Because nobody ever said, you shouldn't do that. How many of you realize that most of us, well, until maybe recent times, most of us weren't really that worried about specifically being nice to our kids. We wanted them to know they were loved. We wanted them to know that they were cared about. But you didn't spend all of your time attempting to be their best buddy. Because you wanted them to grow up and be a functional, mature adult. And that meant sometimes you had to call them on the carpet for things they did not want to be called on the carpet for. That was part of mature parenting. Good for you. And then somewhere in our kind of weird world, in the last generation or so, we got this idea that being nice and having our kids be the, our best buddies in the whole world was going to make the world a better place. I mean, if you've watched the news and realized that has been a failed strategy. Okay, so, so yes, we like to be seen as safe. We like to be seen as polite, respectful, courteous. I'm not saying those are bad things, but by themselves, they don't have anything to do with helping the other person. They have everything to do with helping me. Right? Because if you're the one trying to be nice, you want to be seen as positive, blessing, socially acceptable. You want to be the one that people want to hang around and be with. It makes you feel better about you. But it doesn't help the other person really at all. So in a sense, being nice, as I said, is somewhat negative. We're pulling our punches. We're not helping with wisdom because we want to feel good about us. And if other people see us as positive. Now, what's the opposite of nice? I thank you. I love it. Mean! So if nice is sweet and, 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 and respectful, and great, how many of you have ever met somebody they're mean? They're just mean. And they're not nice people, and they're in your face, and they're quick to get in an argument with you, and, go, ah, and you don't like them because they're mean. How many of you know that's not the opposite of nice? Think about what nice is. If nice is something I do, a way that I choose to act to make me look good, then the opposite of that would be choosing to act in a way that doesn't care whether I look good. That's not quite mean. Do you realize that you can be honest and not mean? How many of you have ever run into somebody who's honest but not mean? I'm not talking about unfiltered. There's a difference, right? Unfiltered people are people who just don't care what you think. I don't have to not care what you think, but I have to say I am not primary, primarily worried about whether you like me or not. I'm pr primarily worried about getting this right. Why am I spending all this time hacking away at the idea of kindness and niceness? Kindness is the opposite of nice. Kindness says, I love you. You are the primary. Not me. Not how I feel about me, how I look to society, but whether you are being, the beloved is being taken care of. That's what we attempt to do as parents. If you're even remotely trying to be a good parent, or if you tried in your time before your kids grew up, you were being kind to them. You wanted them to be able to get up someday and summon the moxie to put their clothes on and go to work and not mope and whine and depend on the rest of the world to take care of them. Right? And that meant you went in and you flipped their light on sometimes and you pulled the covers back and you said, get up, make it happen. I see, right, I see some grins here. Did that ever happen to you, Hope, growing up? I, can, I remember your parents, and I can see them go, no. right? It's just the way it is. And then we do that ourselves. My dad never cared what time I came home. Never. I never had a, ever had a uh, curfew. But when it was time to get up, so I came home 5.30 in the morning from prom. At 7.30 in the morning, my light was on. He said, it's time to roll the backyard. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Three bags full. That's the way it worked. And you better not complain. He was being kind. 
Because how many of you know your employer doesn't care if you gamble at 5.30 in the morning? <laughs> doesn't care. The Bills don't care if you had fun last night at a concert. The Bills don't care. They want to be paid. So you're being kind, making sure that somebody else is reaching for the best they can be. Kindness. How many of you know that kindness is risky? You probably won't tick anybody off by being nice. You might make them disrespect you. You might make them not take you seriously. Because how many of you realize when somebody is too nice, you can tell it's all about them? And so why would you really pay attention as they had benefited you in any way? It's all about them. But the kind individual who is going to hold the truth in good times and bad, because it's not all about correction, in good times and bad, pulls you to a higher level. It's risky. So we started this idea of kindness, and we're told that brotherly kindness, at least his brotherly love, same concept, same Greek words, should continue. And then how? Now the first part was kindness, the second part was brotherly. And this seems to be real simple, right? How many of you think, oh yeah, Christians are supposed to be nice to each other? Back to that word. Have you ever traveled anywhere else and gone to another church? Because you were a visitor? What happened? What? Nothing? They didn't vote you in as president of the congregation? or Okay. Um, have you ever been in a place where you've not been noticed? Okay. Does that feel good? Now some of us go, yes. <laughs> Don't bug me. Don't ask me to give a testimony. Don't ask me to give any money. Just shut up. I'm here. I love Jesus. Go away. Okay. Have you ever been to a place where they do notice you and they are so glad that you are there? Even if you never come back, right? I mean, if you're visiting and you're in Arizona and you don't live in Arizona, the chances of you ever coming back to this church in Arizona don't matter. I mean, they, they're not trying to get you to join their membership and give them money. They're just glad that you're there. Why? Because you're another Christian like they are. The thing that ties you together. Now, I mean, yeah, that's happened to me in churches, on missions, trips. How many of you have been there with me? You've seen that. You've gone to another church, and they just love the fact that you're there. And I know sometimes we go, well, you're in a third world country, and they want your money. How many of you know we've been places where we haven't specifically given them any money? Right? I mean, we might go to work with Church A, and yeah, we're helping them build their building, but now we're preaching in Church B, and we're giving them nothing. We're just showing up. Sometimes we're not even preaching. We're actually just there to visit their church. And they are so happy that you are there. How many of you know that a church in Ghana has almost nothing to do with your American life? They don't get it. They don't watch the TV shows you watch. They're not interested in who your president is. They don't give a care whether your dollar is up or down. They're not interested in the unemployment statistics in your country. It means nothing to them. Why be polite? Well, they're nice people. Back to that word? No. They recognize that you believe in Jesus, just like they believe in Jesus. Now, we dumb so many things down in our language. I cannot tell you what a radical thought this was when Peter tells them that they need to grow in brotherly kindness. When whoever wrote Hebrews said to that crowd, let brotherly love continue. This is a radical idea. How many of you know there are your people and there are everybody else? Come on. We live in America right now. You are on this side or that side politically. You're in this group or that group economically. You're in this group or that group ethnically. And it's your group versus everybody else. And how many of you know that everybody else is wrong? Right? There's your group, whatever that is. And everybody else's group is wrong. They've got the wrong idea, the wrong worldview, the wrong attitude, and they should be mildly suspected all the time. They, they're trying to do something against you and the things that are important to you. Now, 
I wish I could say that was just all those other people. How many of you ever met Christians? Don't point, because they're not here, right? How many of you ever met those other Christians who believe in the same way? It's Christians against the rest of the world. It's our way, our point, our politics, our money, our social potential, and everybody else is wrong. We are so, how many of you know tribalism is not something for jungles? Tribalism exists in the most advanced countries in the world. Tribalism says it's me, my family, my ways, my ideas against the rest of the planet. And in our society right now in America, we are becoming more tribal than ever. And in a country with so many different groups, that's a little scary. Now you say, well, that's just our society. We're messed up. How many of you know back then it was no different? You were Hebrew, and it was us against all the rest of the Gentile world. You were Greek, it was us against all the rest of the, the, the people on the planet. It was this idea, this religion, this, everything was me against everybody else. And in the middle of that, Peter and Paul and others used this crazy idea, brotherly, adelphos in Greek. So philadelphos means love for others as if they were Kin. Now, kin is funny. How many of you go to Christmas dinner with people in your family? How many of you show up to funerals and weddings for people in your family? How many of you would defend a person in your family if they were being attacked by somebody else? <laughs> Depends on who. How many of you always like those same people? <laughs> it was funny. I watched some of the hands go, oh, no. <laughs> right? No, no, you love them. I'm not, I'm not challenging that. You love them. They're related to you by ties of blood, by ties of marriage, by, by birth and other things. But, but they, you just, you know, it's that tribe again. It's them. They're inside and everybody else isn't. And it is so funny how people see that. I have some people in my extended family, dear people that, that I love, and they have an extremely narrow view of family. So when my wife died, they did not understand and still do not understand why I hang out with my brother and sister-in-law. Why would you do that? There's no blood tie. Your wife died. Why? They're not part of your family anymore. How many of you know these people have been my family for 40 years? I'm the uncle to, to my nephews. I, this is how it is. You know, why would I? But, but very narrow view of family. We live in this world, right? Very narrow view. You have to have the same politics. You have to have the same economics. You have to have the same religion. You have to have the same ideology. Or they're not family. And in the middle of this, we're told, treat other believers like family. It doesn't matter whether they're ours or his. It doesn't matter whether they're rich or poor. It doesn't matter whether they have all the same sociological ideas that you do. If they say, I believe in Jesus Christ, he is my Lord and Savior, they're your family. You may not like them every day, but you're going to identify with them. You're going to love them. You're going to pray for them. How many of you realize that that is a social force of change? And that's one of the reasons the church spread so fast. Suddenly you could be a Latin speaker and go to the wilds of Germany and share with these crazy tribes people up there about Jesus and they become members of your family rather than military and political enemies. As a modern, you can go to Far East. How many of you know there are people in Vietnam, and I know we've had wonderful people in this congregation serve uh, this country during the Vietnam conflict. How many of you know that there are Christians in Vietnam? And it doesn't matter the pain that happened all those years ago when it comes to dealing with another believer. They're family, not enemy. And so on. If we don't understand and we don't learn to live out brotherly kindness, being willing to risk, being willing to call to the best people that aren't necessarily part of your group, then don't pretend that you can ever get to the top rung of love. I said, I talked about potholes. Potholes can be everywhere. 
Brotherly kindness can be one of those things. Am I doing it? Or has the freeze-thaw cycle of life washed out my intentionality? Have I gotten irritable? Have I gotten tribal? Have I begun to not be kind to the people around me? Because I want to look good. Because I want to be accepted. Or am I going to identify with you? Even if you're a prisoner. Even if you're a stranger. If I know you love Jesus, you're in. That's a radically different viewpoint. If we don't understand that, we don't really understand love. All we understand is we like our own. Now, I have met people who don't even like their own. How many of you have ever met them? They don't like their kids, they don't like their parents, they don't like the people in their work, in their church, in their neighborhood. Okay, yeah, that's a really bad situation. If you're around a person who doesn't like anybody, well, yeah, they're, they're not in a pothole, they're in the freaking Grand Canyon. You need to get some dirt under them. You need to pull them up and, and try to get them in a better place. But I don't think anybody here is in the Grand Canyon. I don't think any one of you ever are or have been. That's not the case. But it is possible, isn't it, even for those of us who love Jesus, to only focus on those we see as our own and forget that God has got a lot more people out there that he wants you to love and he wants you to make a difference in their life. And we sometimes forget that we have to take the risks to call them to something better and to be willing to be called to something better without getting offended ourselves. Let's bow your heads with me. Lord Jesus, in just a moment here, we're going to take communion. Lord, a story that had more brotherly love in it, I, I, I can't imagine. Lord, there were actually some hard lessons at this dinner. The whole issue of Judas and his betrayal, Lord, is talked about at some degree at the same dinner in which communion was shared. An example of washing feet, dealing with pride and identification takes place in the same story. There is so much here of brotherly kindness. Even at the end of your walk on this earth, you, you're in a situation where you are talking to those that you love best and you are calling them to something higher. You don't try to go out on a nice wave, everybody's happy. You call them to something better. And Lord Jesus, they learned to live that out in the church that they were working in. They learned to live that out in the world that they were a part of. God, I ask you that you touch us today. I'm looking at a group. Lord, I believe that if anybody here is in this building and they don't know you, and they want to say, you know, that sounds pretty cool. I can follow a, a Jesus who loved people, a Jesus who called them to something better that can lead me from where I am in my brokenness to, to doing and living something that's better than I've got right now. I want that Jesus. The right now in this church service, they can say, would you, Lord, come into my heart. Be my Savior. Let me walk with you and follow you. But Lord Jesus, this can be the beginning of a brand new life. That is exciting. But Lord, for the rest of us, and the vast majority of us, I'm pretty sure, know who you are and follow you. Lord, I think most of the time we're pretty nice. And I don't mean that as a slap. Most of the time we want to be respectful and courteous and gracious. But Lord, I ask you that we begin to take a little bit more of a risk. Not even just with the people in this building that we know. But Lord Jesus, you begin to call us to show brotherly kindness to everybody else around. And Lord Jesus, I'm reminded of, I think it's Revelation 3, where the church of Philadelphia is being talked to, and they're a faithful church. And they haven't given up. And Lord, I don't think that just because the name is there that we should assume they're all filled with brotherly kindness. But the truth is there's something incredibly strengthening when you know that there are people that have your back, people that love you, people who will call you to the best things. Lord Jesus, there's something strengthening, hopeful there. And I ask you that we are that strengthening, hopeful bunch of believers. 
And in the practical sense, back to the verse we dealt with in the beginning, we'll go and we'll reach out to the prisoners and the strangers and the hurting. And along the way, we'll find out some of them know you and love you and, hey, they're members of our own family. God, I ask you to give us a new path in your precious and holy word. How many of you say, you know what, I, I didn't really think about brotherly kindness when it came, but like a pothole, it's one that I don't want to hit. I, it's something I want to grow in. Amen. I'm looking, I'm looking at good people. You guys are awesome folks. And yet that can be a challenge that we can grow in, and I hope that we do. Can we have our deacons come and help us with communion this morning? With communion, just to let you know, you say, I've never been here before. Fine. Take communion with us. I'm not sure I'm even you know, okay with this, whatever this denomination is. Fine. Have communion with us. You realize the only limitation that we ask is for your own good. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that'd be the only reason you wouldn't take it. Now you might say, well, I heard once upon a time that if I got odd against a brother, let me give you some interesting words. Get over it. <laughs> well, you don't know what was done to me. Doesn't matter. What was done to Jesus? He got over it. You can too. Does it hurt? Yes. Is it legitimate? Yes. Did the other person do you wrong? Probably. But ask God to help you show brotherly, brotherly kindness and forgive them and then take communion. One of the dumbest things I've ever heard is somebody says, no, I want to hold on to my anger and my bitterness rather than coming closer to Jesus. Don't do that. So if you're here, if you're alive, and if you love Jesus, we want you to share with us, okay? It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 and following, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. It's a blessed thing. If we're here and we have a problem with somebody else, like I said, make a decision as soon as possible. Go make it right. If it's your fault, suck it up, admit it, make it right. If it's their fault, extend forgiveness. We don't want to be in a position where we play rituals, right? How many of you know God's not impressed with rituals? If you were up here and you could jump, you'd understand that you're no lighter, more likely to go through this roof if you've taken communion. It's what's in the heart. It's not what's in the mouth. We're going to ask you to come up here in just a moment and receive. These nice people will be happy to serve. Please hold the elements until all have been served. And I know that there is always a kind board member who runs the hallways and other things and takes care of those. Yeah, thank you, Lord. And um, thank you. Would you come?
being called to something better. And Lord Jesus, I'm so glad that we can learn to walk there. Lord, help us learn to call other people to walk with us. Because that truly is what this is, that we can walk together in this way. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much. Thank you, God. Thank you that somebody once upon a time called us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Jesus. We hold in our hand elements grape juice and bread. And like I said, there's nothing magic about either, is there? Instead, this reminds us. The body of Christ are the people that are standing around you. We're not talking about literally his, I know we're talking about his body, we're remembering his body, broken in torment for us. But look around you, there's the body of Christ around you. Do you know that? That's why it talks about doing it right. Having those right relationships with others. So Lord Jesus, as we hold this bread, Lord, we're reminded of all the people left and right, all the people that are part of our lives far outside this building, relatives and neighbors and co-workers and friends. And Lord Jesus, some don't know you. Some have sicknesses and pains and problems. God, we lift them to you. We ask you for their healing. We ask you for their restoration. We ask you that you would use us to build sound and solid relationships that encourage them and help point them to you. God, we ask you that every place we go, we're reminded of the bread we partake right now. And Lord Jesus, we take seriously the commitment that we're holding. God, we thank you for all the good things you've done for us in your mighty name. Lord, we partake of bread together this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Lord Jesus, we also hold the cup. Lord, we're being reminded that you literally gave everything for us. Everything. You held back nothing. And Lord, we can walk in salvation because you chose to do that. Lord, I ask you that you would reach out and bless and touch those that don't know you yet. And Lord, instead of us being overly nice and afraid we're going to offend them in some way, let us steer that road between, you know, being picky and preachy and on the other hand, just ignoring them. And let us share the hope that you have given us with them. Let them come to know Jesus in the same way that you've let us come to know you. Lord, that's a blessing. So Lord, as we celebrate our salvation, we look forward in encouragement to seeing those we love, those we know, saved too. In your mighty name, amen. Can we partake of the cup together this morning? And Lord Jesus, finishing the service not so much with a religious ritual, but with a reminder we go out into our world. And God, I ask you that we have the opportunity to live all the things your word calls us to and all the encouragement that we have to give to others in your precious and holy name. Amen. God bless you today. Thank you for being with us. I hope that somebody makes you smile today and you make them smile too. God bless.